Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding Error Vector Magnitude. In this short presentation, we'll explain the principles behind Error Vector Magnitude, or EVM, as well as how EVM is used to evaluate modulation quality in radio frequency applications. EVM is used for many different types of digital modulation, but in this presentation, we'll be using Quadrature Amplitude Modulation, or QAM, for most of our examples. If you're not familiar with QAM and constellation diagrams, or if you'd like a quick refresher, you might want to watch the presentation Understanding APSK and QAM before beginning this presentation. As you should already know, many digital modulation schemes are based on symbols, which are unique combinations of amplitude and or phase values. Each symbol represents certain bit patterns. For example, in the 16 QAM constellation, each of the 16 symbols represents a unique pattern of 4 bits, and by altering the amplitude and or phase of our carrier, we can alter which set of bits we're transmitting. In practice, however, the received or measured symbol points usually don't fall exactly on the ideal reference point, and, as we'll see, this can happen for many reasons. If a received symbol point is too far away from the reference point, that symbol or point may be incorrectly interpreted, and bit errors will result. The greater the distance from the ideal or reference point, the greater the probability of bit errors. The most common way to quantify this distance between the measured or actual point and the ideal point is something called error vector magnitude, or EVM. As mentioned a moment ago, each symbol in a constellation has an ideal or reference point that corresponds to a defined magnitude and phase, but received or measured points rarely fall exactly on the ideal point. Part of the difference may be due to magnitude error, that is, the received vector is too long or too short. And part of the difference may be due to phase error, where the angle of the received vector is incorrect. We can quantify these two sources of error by drawing a vector that connects the reference and the measured points, and this vector is referred to as the error vector. Like all vectors, the error vector has both a magnitude and a direction. In digital signal modulation, we're mostly concerned with how far we are from the ideal point, not the direction to the ideal point. So the important measurement is the error vector magnitude, or EVM. EVM is measured at each symbol time, and larger values of EVM indicate greater distance between the measured and ideal points. Greater distances means a higher probability that the receiver will mistake one symbol for another, and thus higher EVM values mean a greater probability of bit errors. Minimizing EVM is therefore one of the most important goals in the design and operation of wireless data systems. The sources or causes of increased EVM fall into four main categories, amplitude effects, phase effects, IQ imperfections, and configuration issues. Compression or nonlinearity is a frequent contributor to EVM, especially at higher power levels, whereas noise, or more specifically, a low signal-to-noise ratio, can increase EVM for lower power signals. Any frequency response or frequency-specific attenuation can also degrade EVM. Other amplitude-related factors are intersymbol interference, external interferers or spurious emissions, and propagation or channel-related phenomena like multipath or fading. With regards to phase effects, this is primarily phase noise in the transmitter and or the receiver. Other types of phase response, where phase changes are a function of frequency, can also lead to higher levels of EVM. Imperfections in an IQ modulator or demodulator, such as gain imbalance, quadrature offset, or carrier feed-through, can be significant contributors to EVM. And finally, some types of configuration issues can impact EVM. For example, having mismatched filters, or different symbol rates at the transmitter and receiver. Even relatively minor contributors to overall EVM become important as the modulation order increases. Higher order modulation, that is, a greater number of symbols, means better throughput since there are more bits per symbol. For example, 16 QAM is only 4 bits per symbol, 64 QAM is 6 bits per symbol, and higher modulation orders have even higher numbers of bits per symbol. However, as the number of symbols increases, the symbols become closer together, and this increases the chance of mistaking one symbol for another. 
Therefore, higher modulation orders generally require better or lower EVM values. In fact, the maximum allowable EVM is often included in various wireless specifications, for example, cellular or 802.11 Wi-Fi standards. And in these specifications, maximum EVM is given as a function of modulation order and coding, with stricter EVM requirements as modulation order increases. So how do we calculate EVM? Recall that EVM is the magnitude or length of a vector connecting the ideal or reference point with a received or measured point. In EVM measurements, the magnitude or length of this vector can be reported in two different ways. The first is relative to the maximum power in the constellation, and the second is relative to the RMS or root mean square power of the constellation. In other words, we calculate and report EVM by comparing the length of the red vector to the length of either the green vector or the length of the blue vector. When comparing EVM values, it's very important to be sure that the same normalization reference was used for each set of values, that is, max or RMS. EVM can be expressed either as a percentage value or in decibels. EVM is calculated on a per symbol basis. That is, at each symbol time, we calculate the magnitude of the error vector connecting the ideal and measured symbol locations. EVM is, however, reported over a number of symbols, often in terms of the maximum value, minimum value, average value, etc. Since EVM is essentially the distance between where our symbols are and where they're supposed to be, lower EVM values indicate better modulation accuracy. For EVM values reported as percentages, these are smaller percentage values. But when EVM is reported in decibels, or dB, the values will always be negative, and so, the more negative the values, the better the EVM. Since EVM is computed on a per symbol basis, we can plot EVM values as a function of time, that is, the EVM of successive symbols. Looking at EVM as a function of time can provide very useful information about any sources of error or inaccuracy in the received signal. For example, slight differences between the transmit and receive symbol rate will appear as a V or bathtub shaped curve. EVM may also be higher at the beginning or end of a bursted or pulse signal due to various amplifier effects or timing. And if amplitude changes over time, this may increase the EVM of symbols with relatively high or relatively low amplitudes. Another way we can look at EVM is as a function of frequency. This is sometimes called the error vector magnitude spectrum and is created by taking the fast Fourier transform of an EVM versus time graph such as the one we'd looked at on the previous slide. One of the more useful and interesting applications of EVM versus frequency is finding in-band spurious signals or interferers. In some cases, the presence of a spurious signal may be difficult to detect when looking at the standard power versus frequency trace. For example, this magnitude versus frequency trace does not appear to contain any spurious signals, but the corresponding EVM versus frequency trace clearly shows the presence of a narrow band spurious signal. EVM versus frequency can be used to find spurious signals because the combination of the desired and undesired signal will cause increased EVM only at or near the frequency of the spurious signal. Another useful way to look at EVM is to plot EVM as a function of input power, and this is normally done when measuring devices such as amplifiers, mixers, etc. Here we see a typical curve of EVM versus power. At very low input power levels, the signal-to-noise ratio tends to be low, and low SNR can often lead to poor EVM. Conversely, very high input power levels may push the device under test into compression, and this will also degrade EVM. There's typically an optimal power region in which the best EVM performance is achieved, and plotting EVM versus power is a convenient way of determining the limits of this region. In addition to plotting EVM versus power or frequency, it can also be very beneficial to plot EVM as a function of both variables. Using these types of three-dimensional graphs makes it easier to identify trends or problem regions for the device under test. Here, for example, we see that EVM increases by frequency more rapidly at lower power levels, and we can also very easily spot a particular combination of frequency and power that leads to an unusually high level of EVM. 
Now that we understand what EVM is and how it can be used, let's look at how EVM is measured. Most often, a spectrum or signal analyzer is connected to the output of the device under test. User-supplied parameters describing the signal properties are used to demodulate the signal and calculate EVM. In some cases, a vector signal generator is used to supply a modulated signal into the dot input, for example when testing an amplifier. In either case, it's very important the instruments used in the measurement setup have better EVM performance than the device under test. A common rule of thumb is a margin of 5 to 10 dB, although generally speaking, the more margin, the better. There are numerous recommended or best practices when measuring EVM. The first of these is to ensure that the reference level is set correctly in order to have a good signal-to-noise ratio. As we've already discussed, if the reference level is set too low, the signal may be clipped, leading to distortion. Too high of a reference level will increase the influence of noise and raise EVM as well. In many cases, analyzers may have an auto-EVM routine that automatically determines the optimum reference level for an EVM measurement. Another important consideration is the number of average EVM measurements. Recall that EVM is computed on a per symbol basis, so we average EVM results over multiple measurements. The number of averages should be high enough to guarantee stable, repeatable results, but keep in mind that a large number of averages may lead to an excessively long test time. Enabling equalization and or frequency response correction is also recommended. And if a vector signal generator is being used to provide a modulated input to the device under test, it's usually a good idea to have both a generator and the analyzer share a common frequency reference. So let's summarize what we've covered. Error vector magnitude, or EVM, is one of the most important measurements of modulation quality. As the name implies, EVM measures the relative magnitude of an error vector that connects the ideal or reference symbol and the actual received or measured symbol. Note that errors may be caused by magnitude and or phase errors. EVM is most often measured using a spectrum analyzer, sometimes in combination with a vector signal generator. Good EVM measurement results require several things, including instruments with good EVM performance, correct setting of the reference level, and an appropriate number of average measurements. This concludes our presentation, Understanding Error Vector Magnitude. If you'd like to learn more about EVM, vector signal analysis, or related test and measurement instruments, please see the links in the video description. Thanks for watching.